Well, it fell to me today to talk about baptism and how the gospel message that Dave just shared with us um, is illustrated in the act of baptism. And uh, it's fortuitous that he also brought up relationship. Of course, we I think everybody here knows from both churches that this is not a religion we've been invited into, but we've been invited into intimacy and oneness with the God that created us. And... Uh, so as I was talking, thinking about it last night, of course, I, I rarely ever write things out. I have to because otherwise I will be um, longer than even Dave is. Uh, so, uh, so, and I have my wife up there saying one, two, three, so I'll know when to stop. So, uh, uh, but as I was talking to the Lord, after I got done doing all the things I wrote out, I'm like, God, I'm never going to get through that. And uh, what came to my heart was uh, that uh, baptism is analogous with marriage. Um, I don't know, uh, I know each individual's experience in marriage is a little bit different, and uh, if you try to uh, stare down analogy too hard, you can find a billion ways to disagree with it, so I'm asking you to just work with me here. Um, so, um, but the truth of the matter is that in, inside of marriage, the whole, uh, the, the, the entering into marriage, one of the first things that we realize is that uh, we've been invited into a relationship that was fundamentally different than anything we've known before. And uh, in the baptism, the three things that we that baptism symbolizes, that's really all it is, is symbolic. First Peter tells us that, uh, that baptism is not the removal of the sins of the flesh, but it's the answer of an already cleansed conscience before God. Once you've come to God, your conscience has been made clear. The thing that the Old Testament could never do, the offering of the, the blood of, uh, of, of innocent animals could never do, is cleanse the conscience. And uh, I'm here to testify, and I imagine that there's a number of here here that can testify that, praise you, Jesus, my conscience has made me clear by the blood of the Lamb. Um, it's not based upon what I have and have not done. In fact, uh, uh, even after coming to Christ, I've had some pretty rank stuff that's come out of me. How about you? Yeah. Um, but you know what? That are not indicative necessarily of my relationship with Him, but the truth of the matter is that I've still been reconciled. It's not based on me. It's based on Him. So the three things that baptism recognizes is first, this symbolism of going into the water and going under and coming up recognizes that this person has already entered into relationship with God. Yes. You don't get baptized, at least not scripturally, if you have not already gotten into relationship with God. It's there to indicate a relationship that existed before you went under the water. And in the same way, if you go to a marriage ceremony, um, you know, you what has happened is you've invited friends and family to come and witness something that's already taken place in the hearts of two people where God has romanced them together and joined and knit their hearts together. Isn't that right? Yeah. The scripture says that, um, that man, that God has joined the hearts together. It's not something the man has done, which is why man's not able to undo it. Right? What God has joined together. Amen? Amen. Isn't that true? So the truth of the matter is that in, when we come to baptism, we're indicating to the world and to our, especially to our family, that we've already entered into relationship with God. That the woman is essentially saying, and you and I, and you know, again, don't take the analogy too far, but uh, um, we play the feminine role in the body of Christ. God is playing the masculine role, and He has pursued us, as Dave said earlier. Uh, it's not a matter of us pursuing Him. Most women would acknowledge, even in a day of feminism, that uh, the truth is that most women are not going to be too romance by a guy um, and want to enter into a, a, a covenant of marriage with them if he invites them to pick him up and take him out to eat and to plan all the dates and everything falls on her wallet and her time. Um, how many women would be romanced by that? Let me get a no takers. Okay, that's what I kind of thought. Um, you know, the truth is that we have been pursued by God and by entering into, by going out into the water, what we've done is we've invited friends and family to come and witness, as in a wedding ceremony, that the God of the universe has pursued my heart and has wooed me, and now I am owned by Him. Yeah. He's captured my heart. And so that is the first state of, of, of baptism. And the second one, of course, is when you're lowered into the water. And... Uh, I, I made notes, so forgive me if I read a little bit. Um, Romans 6 tells us that if we died with him, that uh, if we died the death that he died, then we'll also live the life that he lived. So going under the water, we're representing that we have, as Dave said, entered into his death. Yes. And now what that means is symbolically in marriages, I, I, I've been in ministry for a good number of years, and one thing that I have noticed 
it's pretty pretty standard across the board. I'm not saying there's never an exception to the rule, so again, work with me. But um, by and large, if you have a, a godly woman who is seeking to enter into a relationship where um, the man is the head of the home, usually within a year or less, usually within a couple of months, I can't tell you how many times I've had a girl or a young woman come to me and say, you know, in tears, many times, saying, you know what, I feel like I'm losing my identity. Five minutes, got it. Um, I'm losing my identity. I don't feel, I feel like I'm losing myself. And, uh, and I'm like, you know, as I have analyzed that over the year in my own, in the years in my own heart, I realized that, you know, when we invited to Christ, that's exactly what the invitation was, yes. just to lose ourselves. You know, this life, is, God so integrated the gospel message into everyday life that you'd have to be blind to miss it. And yes, I've been blind. <laughs> and I'm blind even today. Even though, thank God, I'm in relationship, I still don't see all that's made available to me in Christ. But the truth of the matter is that's one of the first things that I've noticed is that, you know, you know, when you're invited into this relationship, this intimacy with the God of the universe, that the first thing you begin to realize is that you begin to lose your old identity. One of the ways that's symbolized probably the most profoundly is that the man doesn't change his name typically. The woman does. She loses her former designation, who she was. Fundamentally, she's the same human being, but her purpose and her goal in life is radically changed. It's not the same. And the same thing happens when we've been invited into Christ. And by lowering into the water, we are saying, you know what, Father God, and to the world and to our brothers and sisters in Christ, we're making a declaration that I have died with Christ. And the person that I once was, I've left behind because now I've been invited into something greater, something more profound, something more transcendent than what I've ever known before. And I'm not going to be known by my former designation. I'm no longer who I was. I'm called by a new name. I'm in a new family. Amen? Amen? And that's part of the new birth. It's part of what we've been invited into. The new... Um, oh, that's... I jumped ahead. Um, so the declaration is that this man has pursued me and won my heart. And that once you have died, Paul says that uh, there's been a loss of identity. There's a new name. So you're, you're the same person, but you have a different purpose. In the same way, Baptist is stating that you've died and now your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Through baptism, we are declaring that we have entered into the death. Now, the fact that Jesus died, what does that mean? The scripture says that if I die the death, he died. Well, how did he die? We know that he died on the cross, but that's really not what that verse is talking about. We knew that. It's talking about the fact that later on, if you read in Romans 6, it says that he died once for all to sin. And sin is really defined as to live independent of union with God. Yes. From the very beginning, both man and woman declare that I want to live independent and have my own life statement independent from you. And that is what God has come and reconciled us from, is a life lived in independence from God. And I don't know about you, I think I do. If you know Christ, you're thankful to be reconciled from independence. Amen. Independence sells, uh, likes to sell itself to people by saying that there's freedom involved in independence. But the truth is, it's the biggest, uh, I like a song that I remember from years ago in Christian music from Whiteheart that said, uh, it's called Freedom, I think it is. or No, it's called Independence Day. And it says, the biggest chain I knew was me. And I know that in my own life that the biggest chain I've ever known was myself. And God has reconciled me from that. The last thing is that uh, the scripture tells us that we were raised with Him. So we died from a life declaring independence from God, and we've ra raised to a new way of living. The scripture says also in Romans 6, that if I died with Him, I also, it stands to reason, it's obvious that I'll also raise the way He raised. I'll live the way He lived. If I'm in union with God, I'm going to be fundamentally a different person than I was the day I met Him. I'm not going to be the same person I was. And that's not done by Mark trying or you trying harder. The invitation is let me come inside of you and let me live this union through you. Amen? Amen. That's what we've been invited into. A real, genuine one oneness with God that's not superficial. It's not in rules and regulations. In fact, all the words that we have in this precious word, all it does is that most of this is not an academic text. If God was going to show us how to live with God, He could have done it in 20 pages or less. Right. But people don't approach and live out of, out, of, out of facts and academia. They live out of relationship. Yes. That is what speaks to us. And this is a book filled with stories of human lives who've had an encounter with the living God. Yes. And what did that look like? 
That's why we have it. That's why it's a little thicker than 20 pages. It's to, it's to get us to recognize that, you know, God is, God is not silent and He's speaking into our lives in relevant ways, not just only in the initial pursuit of our heart to win us back to Himself, but in every moment of every day, He reconciles my heart. Every day. Now, um, the last point that I wanted to make in this raising with God to new life is that if I surrender to Him... Um, the new life, what it says is that I now am not living independent of God, I'm living in union with Him. One thing that I think is often misunderstood, I think often, particularly in this day that we're living in, the Christian faith has gone through many phases and it usually goes through a cycle. And we're in that part of the cycle where we make it all about God's love to us. And we don't remember that even in the Old Covenant, the Bible promised us that the covenant we were going, He was going to cut with humanity in this day. In Deuteronomy, the 30th chapter, the 6th verse, my people are really aware with it because we've been grilling it lately, um, is the scripture says that this is the covenant I will make with you in this day, these days, that I will cut away the thick callus away from your heart and from the hearts of your children, freeing your hearts to love me. Yes with all of your heart, so that the result might be that you really live. It's not about, I mean, yes, the only reason I love God is because He first revealed His love to me. Most women also, again, uh, don't take it too far, and I'm not saying there's no exceptions. I'm just saying that by and large, typically, a woman might be romanced by a man, they might see some things in that man that they, they admire, they might even be attracted to him, but the thing that really seals the deal often for a woman is when she realizes that that love is towards, of his heart is towards her. Now admiration gives birth and flowers into love and dedication. And the, the Bible says that our relationship with God is the same way. That we love Him not because we loved Him first, but He because He loved us first. Yeah, I mean, you might have had an admiration for God and wanted to pursue Him and get to know who this guy is, uh, you, know, uh, you know, on a topical level. But until God, by His Spirit, revealed in your heart that He is passionate about you, you were never free to love Him in response. That's right, but as soon as in the heart it was revealed that God pursues me and loves me, my heart was freed. To love. Isn't that right? Yeah, now, uh, point, right? So the new covenant, I think, is not mis misunderstood in many ways in saying that uh, the focus is all about God loving me. And, and that's very important because if I don't recognize that, I can't love Him back. But the truth of the matter is that that was not what we were invited into. The, but the callous that was cut away, the new covenant didn't change God, it changed me. You know, we, we often approach the new covenant as though it set God free to finally start loving us. When in reality, you know, if he had not already loved us, he would have never pursued us, right? right? God so loved the world that he died, that he gave, right? His love was already secured. The new covenant didn't change God, it changed me. And it set, it set his heart free to love me, it set my heart free to love him. Yes. To live in dedication to him, to not live it out of a self-statement that I am independent from you any longer. The last thing that I'll bring up to you is as we're being raised up from the water, that uh, Jesus gave this exact same question to Peter, and I think that he asked it of us pretty regular. And that was, Peter, do you love me more than these? Now by these, I want to explain to you that there's a lot of people that, that have different views on what he meant. Most people think it was the other disciples, and I don't think Jesus was trying to create rivalry, because they already had enough of that. Um, I think that what he was pointing to was the thing that all the disciples returned to when they thought that their Messiah had died. They went back to what was familiar. Fishing. That's in fact where Jesus found them when he made this statement. They were out fishing. And Jesus asked me, he said, Peter, I want to ask you something. The same guy that, of course, denied him three times adamantly with cussing, um, denied him ab absolutely. I mean, the scripture does say that. Um, he asked him, he said, you know, I love this about Jesus, that he doesn't cut around, uh, he doesn't, you know, go around the bush. He's direct. He looked him right in the eye and he said, Peter, do you love me more than this career of fishing? And Peter said, you know, Lord, I, I like you. I'd like to say I love you, but I like you. And the, the question that, what, that most people often miss, and I know I'm sure Dave has taught this before as well as I have, that the love that Jesus was asking, the way it reads in the Greek is this. He, says, he said, Peter, do you love me by a love that is called out of your heart, out of my preciousness to you, a love of dedication that compels you to give yourself sacrificially for me? That's what he asked him. He asked him, do you agape me? And he said, well, Lord, you know I flail you. I kind of like you as a friend. I see some common ground. I like you. But no, not so much agape. Second time he said, you know, Peter, 
Do you love me with a self-sacrificial love called out of my preciousness to you? A love that compels yourself to give yourself to me sacrificially. He hung his head against the Lord, you know. You know, I like you. I want to say that, but I, you know, I like you. The third time Jesus asked him, and I love this, I wouldn't have wanted to be Peter, um, but Jesus said, Peter, do you even like me? And it said at that point that Peter felt heavy. Well, I would have too. And yet the same thing, the same thing is said, the same dialogue has happened between God and I. He doesn't do that to condemn us. What he does is, is he's calling us out to realize that, you know what? I did not die for you just so you can live a life of being lavished in my love, but to reciprocate by loving me in return. Uh, And that love requires that in the dying to sin, I'm living in not in independence from God, but total dependence upon Him. In the new life that I now live in Christ, I don't live for myself. I live for the one who loved me and gave His all for me. Amen. How many women in here would recognize that when you got married, you found that um, a lot of things wound up being a lot about him. And he t- you're allowed to raise your hand. It's okay. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I got a handful of people. Um, the truth of the matter is that God has invited us, and in. He has spent Himself entirely upon us. You don't have to worry about that. That's where males have a tendency to fail. Our part of the relationship is we're supposed to continue to cherish and pursue all the days of our life, as God does with us. But the truth of the matter is that it's not just an empty relationship. We weren't invited to just be lavished upon, but to lavish. Yes. To love with passion and abandon. So uh, as we go uh, across the street, those of us who are going to for baptism, I want us to keep in mind that what you've been invited to is a ceremony that gives an, uh, an outward indication of an inward reality that this heart has already been won by their lover of their soul. And that this is, all this is, is just a pronouncement that I have died and when I come up, I'm symbolizing that I am now the bride of Christ and I will forever live dedicated in love towards Him. Yes. Amen? Amen. Father God, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we thank You for Your beautiful, beautiful love. We thank You for the fact that we didn't have to convince You to pursue us, but You pursued us out of the integrity and the depth and the honor of Your own heart. And Lord, we thank you for the fact that you've knit even our hearts together, that there is no such thing, even as Suhan said earlier, there is no such thing as our church, their church, or anything like that. There's one body, and we love you. And Lord, we're dedicated to each other, and we're dedicated to our Lord. We thank you, Lord, for all these things. And even as we honor you and do the symbolic act of baptism, we do not in any way believe and rely upon baptism as removal of the sins of the flesh or of our estrangement from God. That's already happened. It's a declaration that we've already embraced the reality of being made one in Christ. Lord, we thank you for it. It's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Mark. Oh, I've been set free. I've been redeemed by